So today I think it's a special show for me. And I don't mean to be selfish about that, but I, I, I really want to do this show and share with you uh, people, keep, I'd, I'd have to say very important people I met. I didn't know they were important at the time I met them because you just keep meeting people. But these were folks I've met and still know very well who were transformational in my life, transformational in my, in my way of understanding plants, in my way of designing with plants, in my way of planting and putting plant communities together, plant relationships together, and also in a way of understanding the value of collaboration, partnerships, and associations, and the value of having friends. You know, just having friends is, is so purposeful and such a beautiful thing. So I'm gonna kind of read a little thing I put together with who I'll be talking about today, and then go on a little bit about each person and what that moment of transformation was. It was just a brief moment, but yet it changed my way of thinking and questioning everything I do as far as being a grower of perennials and native plants and being a planter of perennials and native plants and understanding systems, how the value of systems work. So I'll start with Ray Schulenberg, Pete Outoff, Tom Vanderpool, Cassian Schmidt, and Gerald Wilhelm. Each one had and have ways to initiate land and plant practices based on connections. That was a key, relationships. They've created thoughtful procedures based on health, artful environmental practices, and shared the possibilities of new approaches to planting and to enhancing natural relationships. And this is the best part. They are all fun to be with. You know, so every time I was with them, it was just joyful. And I hope it was joyful for them dragging me around wherever they went and participating in all the wonderful things they were doing. So let me start with Ray. So you'll see the images come up as I speak. It won't be as much looking at my lips move right now as it is the images. And this is Ray Schulenberg. And basically, Ray Schulenberg was a curator of woody plants at the Morton Arboretum. And in 1961 or 62, he started a prairie at the Morton Arboretum. And now it's called the Schulenberg Prairie. And he was passionate about finding the remnant remains of prairie and other remnants from um, savanna, wetlands that were left in the Chicago area. And he had friends that contributed to that. There was Floyd Swink, uh, Bob Betts, and I'll think of the name of the other fellow. He was very instrumental too. I'll get into that, I can't remember his name. But anyway, I didn't know what they, I didn't know anything about this. I was just a kid trying to figure out how to hit a baseball. And by 1978, when I started growing perennials at the Natural Garden, I didn't know what anything was. I didn't know anything about plants. I was an outdoor ed teacher. So I went to the Morton Arboretum and I saw a prairie, recreation, prairie recreation. And I was shocked. And even telling you now is exciting. I got have the goosebumps when I first saw it. It was so magical. And I couldn't figure out why isn't this everywhere? What, what, what would keep people from planting this along every roadside? Back everywhere. What, was, what would happen? Why not? So I had to meet the person who created it. I wanted to know more about it. And being at the natural garden, I thought it would help me understand the plants I'm propagating and growing and dividing and replanting better. So I went into the main building. I just walked in. I didn't call anybody or set up an appointment. And I asked who was responsible for the prairie, because at the time it wasn't the Schulenberg Prairie. It was the prairie at the Morton Arboretum. It was even hard to get to. You had to walk through this open field park somewhere that you weren't sure was a good parking place. But when you got there, it was stunning. So they said, well, it's Ray Schulenberg's office is down the hall. And I said, well, is that if I go in there? Yeah, go ahead. It just said, yeah, go ahead. So I walked down the hall, I look in the room and there's Ray. At the time, I didn't, I've never seen him before. So I assumed it was him. And I knocked on the door and he looked up. He goes, yes. I go, oh, Mr. Schulenberg, my name is Roy Diblick. I have some questions about the prairie out here. And his whole face lit up. 
like he actually was excited to see me <laughs> come in. So I, I walked in, he goes, and he stood up, shook my hand, he goes, well, so what are your questions? What, what is it? I said, this is the first time I've been out here. I've never seen it. And I'm really curious about everything that has happened here. And he said, well, in what way? I said, well, first of all, why isn't this everywhere? And he got kind of, not sad, but straight face. He said, Roy, I'll tell you. He said, the public's just not ready for it yet. The people out, outside of the Arboretum, they're just not, they're just not ready for this type of planting. And then I told him I was at the natural garden, just took over there, and he beamed up again. Oh, you're taking over for Walter, Walter Stevens. I said, well, yeah, Craig Sensor bought it and he asked me to run the natural garden. And he just stood up and shook my hand again. He was so excited that someone would take over for what Walter Stevens had done since 1953. But I didn't tell him I was dumb as a stick and didn't know a plan from a doorknob. <laughs> I didn't want to disappoint him. But I did tell him that I'd like to think about these plants and I'd really like to start growing these native plants. And he smiled again and he said, Roy, that would be so wonderful, but I just have to tell you this. I go, yeah, well, yes. He said, nobody's going to buy them. And I got really discouraged. He said, again, people just aren't ready. I said, well, I think we'll try it and we'll put them in containers, but I don't know anything about growing them. So it was not that year, but the spring after that, and I, I have to say, I wasn't best friends with Ray. I was more someone that just could show up anytime I wanted. And he was the person that was never discouraged or, or had always had time for you. So I would show up with plants and things and I showed up, he gave me a list of all his production notes. He uh, Xeroxed, at that time he Xeroxed everything. <laughs> so we Xeroxed him, he gave me all his production notes. And then he told me about the book I've showed on my Instagram, the Prairie Propagation Handbook, which has a wealth of information in it. It's a thin little book, wealth of information. So without even thinking, he gave me this whole list of everything he's done since 1961. This was 1979 when I grew my first native plant. So I, I read everything in detail, putting them in the ground, covering them with newspaper, putting them in flats, putting them in little pots, and everything. I tried everything. And I was almost very successful with every method I tried. And the most successful in me was putting them into seed flats, putting them outside and covering them with newspaper. And then they were germinating in the spring. I would take the newspaper off and I would transplant them in June. And that was kind of on Ray's list, except he had a greenhouse. But what was so important to me was the fact that I could show up anytime and he would have the time to share with me about all the the conditions I was do, planting, and I would bring him plants, and he would, I, as he put his coat on, he would say, oh, Roy, that's, that's Carex radiata. And I would stand up and think, he's like a wizard. How can he know what sedge this is based on simply taking a look at it while he's putting his coat on? So, and I'll get, this is probably the most important moment I had. This was my transformational moment with Ray. Uh, I volunteered on Tuesday nights at the prairie. So at that time, in, I believe it was 81 or 82, I would go every Tuesday and pull weeds and do whatever activity uh, was taking place. And one, he was there, we were putting a pathway in. So we put this, it was only one cinder block wide. And we we're chopping the soil with a little hand rototiller and putting this flat cinder blocks in. And Ray told, uh, told me and, and the fellow I was working with, he, he sold tires from Wheaton, I think, or something. He said, I want only one cinder block wide, Roy. I said, okay, I, and we wanted to go, why so narrow? I want people to walk through here and I want everyone who walks through there to be touched by the plants. And okay, that's what's cool. To have that intimate connection with the plants, something you can drive a golf cart through and a, a, a golf cart with refreshments on it and sell soda to people. It wasn't a marketing thing. It was the int intimate relationship with the plants as you go through. And to be honest, some people were afraid to go through the walk. The plants, were, when they got taller, people were intimidated by the height of the plant. And you can't blame them. It's just 
because of our lack of connection and relationship to plants, it can be intimidating. And the second thing which kept me up all night when this experience, this with Ray, I went out to a graveyard with him in uh, Naperville, Illinois. And he was inventorying the cemetery graveyard to give it a, a rating for native plant population, prairie population. Uh, he had, Jerry Wilhelm had come up with a way of rating plants so you could kind of determine the value of an area based on its native plant population. So he put a square meter on the ground, he took it out of his trunk and laid it on the ground. And he goes, can you count how many native plants are in here, Roy? And this was in kind of early spring, maybe June, late early June, late May. And at the time I could kind of tell because I was growing about at that time 60, 50, 60 species from seed. So I could identify the foliage pretty well. And then I started counting and it came up to be, geez, almost 14, 16, 14, 16 species in this square meter. And what did I think personally? I thought this is not good. We have to, have to, horticulturally, we have to dig all this out and divide them and put them on 18, 24 inch centers and put mulch in there and get them healthy again. And I said, Ray, is this healthy? I didn't, that's what my mind was thinking. I didn't say that because I could be dead wrong. <laughs> so I, I could look stupid within, but I didn't want to look stupid without, outside of myself. So Ray goes, what do you think? I said, well, is this okay? There's too many plants in here, isn't there? And he looked at me and said, Roy, Take a good look at that. You know what you see? You see Illinois Prairie. This is what has been here, was here, and will never be again, probably, more than likely. This is the healthiest place you can be in Illinois. And that boggled my mind. To have such intimacy, 14 species living healthy, tight, well together, and how they got to be that way over thousands of years since the glaciers left I couldn't I couldn't go home I went home and I didn't sleep well because the whole time I was thinking when the landscape contractors came in well we put them on 24 inch centers and we surround everything with wood and we want to see the shape of the plant and they believed and they were sharing this that's healthy well no that's not even close to healthy that's almost that's almost scary so at that time, that's when I never used wood again. I just didn't have the emotional way of putting wood around the plant and, and harming the lifestyle that they pos the possibilities of who they could be as far as healthy plants. But that moment when Ray pointed that out, that changed every dynamic way of thinking about how plants live well together. Of course, I didn't know how to do it. That was in 82, but I realized that was a goal for me to understand how to place plants and understand relationships of plants, putting them together so they could live well together. So Ray and I stayed connected. We, you know, I would see him, I, like I said, I, I'd maybe see him five times a year, four times a year. And then he started coming to some of my talks and would tell me things I need to change in the way I spoke and how better ways of presentation, uses of language. such. He was a teacher and he was sincere and he cared. And, and I think that those th three things, plus being just a good human being, I appreciated so much to have him in my life for all those reasons. And also to sh explain in, in more detail how living systems worked. So that was Ray Schulenberg. And in some of the next images, you see the prairie he created, the Schulenberg Prairie. It's the most diverse prairie recreation in the Midwest. It has almost 14 to 16 species per square meter. And these last two pictures of it in the fall, you can see the diversity and beauty of it. And that led me through Ray. This is a picture of my first grass garden ever designed. And it was uh, Indian grass, schizacrium, sargassum schizacrium, and Aragrasis spectabilis. But you can see through understanding the prairie associates, 
I just started to drift little bits of um, schizacrium into the aragrasta. So I didn't put group, group, group. It was hard to break that for me, group, group, group. But I put group, mingle a little, group, mingle a little, and then big group and mingle a little within the group. So it was my beginning. And that first design I ever did, that you see here with the five grasses, four grasses, that was in 1996. So it took 14 years before I even put plants to ground and associated them more than production because I was a grower. Now the next person that I have here, you can see, is Pete Outoff. And he's sitting here with Anya, his wife, two of the, I had two of the nicest, truest people I've ever met. And I, 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 I say that sincerely because the first time I met Pete, I didn't know anything about Millennium Park. I'm in Wisconsin. Why the hell would I care what goes on in Chicago anymore? I moved away from Chicago. And I like Chicago, but I moved to Wisconsin. I got the Kettle Moraine. I got goat prairies to walk through. I'm growing 400,000 plants a year, sending them down to Midwest ground covers. I got a good life. I could let my hair get grow this long, and nobody cared. No one said anything. I stayed at the nursery and kept growing plants nobody wanted because that was how I was. I, I grew sedges nobody wanted. I grew native plants nobody wanted. <laughs> but it was the curiosity of the plants. So I heard about Millennium Park and I said, well, that's cool. Yeah, another park in Chicago, I didn't know much about it. And then I got a fax in July of 2001. And I knew of Pete Outoff because I had his book, Gardening with Grasses. A fellow from Holland gave it to me. And I was so moved by Gardening with Grasses, that book, because it wasn't just grasses A through Z. It was grasses interplanted and intermingled with all other plants. And they were intermingled socially well together. And I took that book when I got it to Midwest Ground Covers, who I was growing plants for. And I might have seemed very silly to everybody there that day at our production meeting. I held the book up and I said, the time is here. It's not plants in big groups anymore. Not 100 Rudbecki, 100 Sedum, 100 Carl Forrester, 100 Perovskia. It's mingling and mixing plants in social communities. Look at this book. I was so moved by gardening with grasses. So I knew of Pete, Pete Outoff. And I got a fax in July. I said, hello, Roy. My name is Pete Outoff. I'd like to come and visit you with an associate friend of mine, John Cook. We'd like to come out in September. I had the fat, I ran around the farm <laughs> so excited that I could meet Pete Outoff. I'm running, oh my God, Pete Outoff's coming out. And September came, and he and John Cook came in a rental car. He drove out from O'Hare. And then Pete pulled into Northwind, and when he pulled up to Northwind, he said, I kind of knew Roy when I got here. You would be the person that would help me with Millennium Park because we were growing the 400,000 perennials and we had a field full of perennial stock beds. Plus we have a 1906 dairy farm. That's our, our, our buildings are all built in 1906. We got a post and beam barn and it reminded him of his place, the charm of his place. And with Steve and Colleen and myself, we were all about charm. The three of us had different ways of approaching it, but we were, it was a joyful place for us to have, a, have our careers. So Pete came out and he had cameras hanging. He had three or four cameras hanging from his, uh, and the first thing he had his plan for Millennium Park rolled up. He wanted to show it to me. He ran out into the production field, cameras flying around. He wanted to see that purple that was in bloom. And it was Allium Summer Beauty. And he liked the Summer Beauty, but you see how curious he was and still is. He's tremendously curious about every plant he sees. And the curiosity goes into knowing that plant, not just being aware of it, like I mentioned in other shows, how, tell me about this plant, Roy. And he writes it down. How do I get some of these plants? Tremendous curiosity and interest and passion in plants. So after we talked about summer beauty, we went to the potting shed. We got in the potting shed, you walk in there, there's barn swallows flying in. They miss your head by about two inches. I'm thinking, is this gonna be okay sitting in here? He sat at the picnic table with the barn swallows flying in the, and this was a magical moment right then and there. First it was meeting Pete, 
who's creating something within our industry, creating the change in our industry. But when he rolled out the Millennium Park plan on that table, it was the first plan I've ever seen where I could see everything in 3D. I could see the plant names, I saw everything coming up in 3D. And I never had that happen to me before on any plan. I just saw Rudbeckia and Sedum Autumn Joy and Echinacea purpurea. But it was the intimacy of every plant coming up at different moments, relating at different times of the year. The flower colors and the structure of plants holding plants up. And I just, I just, I didn't know what to say. I just, I, right away I told him, this is going to be beautiful. And he wanted to know, what won't work, Roy? Can you see anything on there? So we sat there for about two hours talking. Hour and a half, our crew left, and Pete and I were still talking, and John was walking around. And I realized after two hours talking with Pete, this is the longest I've ever talked to anybody about plants that haven't got up and couldn't wait to leave to do something else. <laughs> we, we sat and talked for two, two and a half hours about root systems, how plants grow into each other, what wouldn't work, what if we tried it, what about the soil that's going to be at mine. It was a beautiful conversation. So after that uh, moment, I, Pete left and then asked people at Money Park if I could grow the plants and be responsible to help lay the plants out when Pete came two years later. And of course, they, they said yes, and they came out to see who the heck is this guy. So, so John Bryan, Ed Euler came out to see what's this guy in Wisconsin. And, and they got it once they got out there, we started talking. They could see that, uh, that I did have the knowledge of plants because I've been growing them for 30 years. And I could, I could because I could grow 400,000 two and a half inch pots, I could pr produce 16,000 perennials. And, and then know the growers that could produce the rest. So some of these images show you the combination of plants that of peat. These are combinations that are peat out off. The Echinacea pallida and Echinacea purpurea blended together. The composition on that is too beautiful. And the Echinacea with, with the Parthenium integrifolium, too beautiful. And no, it's not that no one would ever come up with it, but it's something people just weren't ready to try yet. And I don't think it was fear. I think it was lack of knowledge of plants. Even, even the people putting native prairie gardens in weren't understanding of how to mix the plants together based on how they would grow into each other. Most of the prairie gardens were just big blue stem Indian grass, New England aster, or Retitiba panata. There were five or six things that dominated. But Pete had this understanding and still has a great understanding of the relationships of plants growing into each other and block planting in small ways, big ways, and weaving plants in between. Pete's an artist, but he's a sensitive artist. And that sensitivity has great creative dynamics. And all of you out there, you all have that capability too. I sometimes have always created stories that held me back. Oh, I can't do that. That's, he does that because he's much better than I am, or this person's better than she is. Well, we're never going to be <coughs> Pete Outoffs, but that doesn't mean we can't be creative in our own way and create our own signatures. I, I always want you to think about that because I keep thinking about that. And we all will reach the level that I think we'll be uh, always challenging ourselves and have different ways of moving through life at our own pace, our own level. And you can see the Parthenium still in bloom with the Echinacea and the prairie drop seed in the back. Beautiful combinations, but healthy combinations. That's the key. The stewardship on this is minimal because the plants have grown into each other at such a, a good level. And the other thing, this image comes up when I went to visit Pete with Krista Orm Keller from Midwest Ground Covers. This was 2002. He goes, Roy, you want to go meet Ernst Pagels? I said, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Well, yeah, yes, I'd love to meet. I don't know what I'll say to him. I don't, I, I don't even know if I feel, yeah. So we drove up into Germany, and again, that's Pete. He could easily say, okay, look around the garden. I got stuff to do. Tell me when you're done, we'll go get lunch. He goes out of his way 
to introduce you, to be a connector, and introduce you to people that are important to him and, and found ways to benefit him and help him become Pete Outoff, he takes you to those people. That's a genuine human being. So we drove all the way up to Germany, and there I'm saying, oh my God, it's Ernst Pagels. And people would say, well, really, who's Ernst Pagels? Well, to me, he, he, the majority of perennials I was growing, East Friesland, Salvia Blue Hill, Miscanthus, I was every, he's one of the best hybridizers of perennials through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, because when he was hybridizing plants, it wasn't based on how much money can I make. It was based on how much, what can I create that would be different and beautiful than what we already have, but yet be, again, be healthy, have garden value. And when, when I met him, I, I, I just felt honored, honored and content in a way that I could meet somebody, again, that changed the way we look at traditional perennials. And he was good friends with Carl Forster, not the grass. You might, you might think, oh, the grass? He, he buddied up to her. No, Carl Forster, the human being, the person that created, they were best of friends through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, until he passed away in 1970. So that was, that was a special moment. And again, that was Pete being a special person to, to take us on that, on that trip. And here's Pete, when we got to Lurie Garden. See, it just was wonderful. We were laying out 26,000 perennials. When those perennials showed up, all the other contractors that were behind, oh, we got time now. Look at all the, they'll never get that done by late June. So there's 26,000 perennials. Uh, Terry Gowen, who was a landscape architect at Millennium Park, she was wonderful because she, she was constant movement. One day after the next, we got things done. We got things done. She, she made the whole project work because of her, she was a ramrod, but everything was done properly. And the contractors knew that so that when they worked with her, they knew get things done right because of her personality. And she was gentle and kind at the same time. So we spray painted the whole garden out on, before, the plant, before the plants got there and why they were unloading. We labeled everything had labels in all the plants. Then when Pete showed up, the other surprise, this was good. A lot of the guy, where's the architect? They all hear about this guy coming from Holland. Where's the architect? And they were shocked to hear this tall guy with the gray hair comes up. And they were going, where's his staff? How are you gonna get this done? Where's all his young people with clipboards? No, it's just Pete Outoff. There's no, there's no black uh, Cadillacs pulling up one after the other, unloading celebrity designers or anything. It's Pete Outoff shows up by himself to lay out 26,000 plants. And here he is in, the, in action. He was actually placing every plant, moving them around. I sent them in wheelbarrows to where the sticks were. We matched up the sticks. They dropped off the plants. Pete was there with Terry Goins crew spacing, putting everything, all the field adjustments were done by Pete. So he had a tremendous sensitivity, not just to his original design, but yet the feel adjustments of laying and moving the plants around. And I, he probably, he didn't lay out all 26,000, but he did, Roy, we're gonna move some of this over here. I'm gonna make this bed a little wider. We change it with the spray paint. And we were done planting the 26,000 plant. These were mostly gallons in some quarts. We got done in two weeks, two and a half weeks. We had a delay because some of the soil wasn't in it. And the other contractors there were shocked. They were just, oh my God, how did you do that? One, because of Terry Gowen, tremendous organization, getting everything spray painted. We spray painted the label that was done wonderfully well. And two, because Pete kept moving. He kept, you know, he got there at six o'clock, boom, 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 kept, kept moving everything forward because he was conscientious of time and also he was sensitive to the siting and laying out of the plants and what their future would be. So this whole project went wonderfully well. And I, got a, I threw a picture of me in because I never wore a hard hat. This was an odd look for, for me to have the hard hat. And you see us in the, I'm in the, the uh, Salvia River. So, and there's a picture of it finished, uh, a week old to two weeks old that you see. 
And here's some of the combinations that are in, in, uh, in Lurie Garden and still strong. The 20 year anniversary is next year and everybody is looking forward to that, having the anniversary, celebrating the park, which changed Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago. Has more visitors than any site in Chicago, I think right now, more than Shedd Aquarium and uh, Navy Pier. And the combinations, people are just amazed when they walk through the hedge, they go, what, what is this place? And one of the beautiful combinations is this one of Provskia with Aragrasis spectabilis. Both loving dry soil, both thriving well together, but the contrast in the fall color you see on this picture with the flowers in bloom, the copper flower with the ghost gray foliage of Provskia, that's always been one of my favorite uh, combinations of Pete. And then a simple drawing he left me with at a project in Omaha. And you can see on this drawing, it looks complicated, but it's an overlay. The bottom one is Carex albicans, Cesleri autumnalis, Deschampsia goldtau in large groups. And then the top one are the mingling plants. You lay out the mingling plants first, and then you surround them with the Cesleria Carex and Deschampsia. So one overlay over the other. I laid out the mingling plants because Pete had to fly back home and then just followed up and surrounding him with those three plants. So his designs are very complex, but it easily interpreted, which is another good factor. When, when I've helped Austin, Austin and I laid out Detroit, it went well because the complexity is easy to interpret. And Pete makes it that way with his, his knowledge of plants and his way of putting the patterns together on the design. So I, I, I'll, I'm gonna move on, but I just have to say it's been one of the, it's one of the most, best periods of my life. When I went from being kind of a designer, learning from native plants, how patterns and rhythms of plants go together uh, through look, r walking through prairies, and then meeting Pete Outoff. And I remember the one first thing he told me when we got to North, when I had some Cesslerias and Salvi East Friesland together. He goes, Roy, that's a nice combination, but you know what you could do? I said, no, I, I, I no, stretch it out, Roy. And every design I do now, I think of Pete doing that, stretch it out. He said, you're too choppy. And when I looked at it in the essence of what he said, yeah, I got chop, 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 chop. I, my patterns were too choppy. And he says, you can have some choppy patterns when you stretch out one this way, stretch out some groups this way. You can put some choppy things in if they fit the rhythm, the vertical rhythm that you have created with, with the patterns you have stretched out. So I always remember that. And that dramatically changed the way I design. First native plants looking at their patterns and rhythm of how they lived. And then the patterns I create with perennial, good solid perennials and native plants to make sure I, I stretch things out. So I have more, more of a, a, a length of something, more timing to walk by it than being distracted by being too choppy. So another, that, again, that's someone that moved my life forward and I'm very solid and I'm still, I have, still have to say one of the best friends I have is Pete, he's such a good person, and Anya too. They're both wonderful people, so I've been very lucky. And I move on now to someone else that I miss very much. I met Tom Vanderpool in 1982 when I started growing natives. He started a native plant business. He, uh, he had one light, white pickup truck. 31 years later, he had one white pickup truck. <laughs> But he, he lived in Barrington, Illinois and became the, well, the head of a conservation group. I gotta remember the name of their group. It's a conference, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it right now. Conservation group in Barrington. He was there for 31 years plus had his own business. And people in Barrington, they would give their land to the conservation group, citizens for conservation. They would give land to them like their farm and then Tom would go in there with the volunteers and turn it into a prairie. 
Tom was the best grower of prairies from seed I've ever met in my life. Because I've never seen, I would, every time I'd see a prairie put in eight, nine years later, there was too much diverse. It was tremendously diverse. And so he kept coming to Natural Garden to buy plants from me. Then he invited me up to see some of the prairies. And I'd walk through them. I'd go, well, how did you do this, Roy? Well, give me five years. How did you do this? How did you get bottle gentian in this woodland edge, in this savanna? Give me 12 years, Roy. I can do that. And simply what Tom understood at such a high level he didn't put 150 varieties of native plants together, eighth of an ounce, quarter of an ounce, sixteenth of an ounce, and mix them in that fashion at all. He put a matrix of short grasses in, little blue stem and um, Budalua, Budalua curtipendula, I can't remember the common names, because Acrums Copera and Budalua curtipendula. Those were the short grasses, because when he got the short grasses modestly established, they would let sunlight through to the, the, the ground, and he could still keep seeding in other species. So what he called them were welcoming, welcoming seed, seedlings of a welcoming nature. So that the next time he threw seed out, they were welcoming and caring for the next group of seedlings. And I started, okay, that's too beautiful. <laughs> but it's not just saying it, he knew how to do it. And he would, constantly seed every November. He never stopped seeding. That's how he could get bottle gentian into a situation. I thought when I saw all these bottle gentian that he probably put plugs in and how would he water and weed around all these six, seven hundred plugs? All he did was wait for the right community to establish and knew that was a nurturing community and he would see drop this prairie gentian seeds in within that nurturing community. And it kind of makes me tear up that he had that kind of sensitivity towards seeding. And then when those plants would come up, they would all interact together and live as a, a healthy community. But it, it, again, it took him 12 years to get there, which was so cool that it, it wasn't common to most of us. Don't you want things yesterday? I want a big screen TV. Can I get it tomorrow? Is there some way I can buy it? We want everything right now. And what's the last thing you think about a year later? how badly you wanted a big screen TV. You don't even remember the desperation you had to have something. Because once you get everything too quickly, it, it doesn't have any value. You got it, uh, I'm going on to the next thing I want that I gotta have. So with Tom, it's, it's all about the ride to get there. And here he is uh, in the prairie in Barrington. And you see who's traveled 2,000 miles to take a walk with Tom Vanderpool in this picture? Pete Outoff. Pete and Anya came all the way from Holland, and it wasn't to put in a, a major garden, it wasn't to go to a, a fundraiser, it wasn't to, it was to walk in a prairie in Barrington with Tom Vanderpool. Curiosity, humility. I don't know everything and I want to learn more. So here's, I traveled 22 miles. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, am I gonna get there? Here Pete Adolf traveled 2,000, 3,000 miles from his home in Holland. That's another reason Pete's successful with his planning. And Tom Vanderpool, look at him. He could be home doing something else. He's out giving prairie tours all the time and showing people the possibilities of native plants and how to put them in, in good relationships. And what Tom showed me was the difference between a commercial prairie and a prairie of sincerity, a prairie going in a sincere direction for diversity. This is a commercial prairie outside of, uh, actually it's outside of the Ball headquarters in West Chicago. A commercial prairie is big blue stem Indian grass, New England aster, maybe some gray-headed coneflower, Monarda fistulosa that's on its way out because it's getting out competed by the big tall grasses. And that's about it. You got five, six species per prairie. And Tom showed me the difference in understanding how to get eight, 10, 12 species per square meter, which was influenced in my thinking process from Ray Schulenberg, a healthy, diverse prairie. So I was very fortunate that Tom, one, took the time. We walked a lot through, through remnant prairies. We walked a lot through his established prairies. But that distinguishing characteristic between a commercial prairie and a prairie of sincerity and diversity, I, I 
fully appreciated. Um, and here's a, this is a picture you'll see, it's a seeded prairie, only 14 years old. People see this prairie, they think it's a prairie remnant. They have no idea that this prairie is only 14 years old. And the next picture is a, a little bigger picture of that prairie, the Echinacea pallida, Asclepias tuberosa coming up. Again, a 14-year-old seeded prairie. And what Tom was so wonderful at was community. Because he's always worked by himself with his one white pickup truck, all his, his employee, employers that did all the work, they were the people that lived within the community. You see them all in a line, Tom's, Tom's got them all in a line with white buckets. He mixed up seed to put in every bucket. He knew where they were going to walk and he knew where they'd scatter that seed and he knew what seed to put in their bucket knowing where that seed would fall in relationship to what plants it would be seeded with. And then the community would break off into small groups. This is in Font Fontana where uh, they would go out and collect seed for next year's sowing and expanding the prairie. So not only did Tom work with community in a large way in November seeding, he worked with community in smaller ways, breaking off into different groups and finding out which people like what practices as far as burning, collecting seed, weeding. And the whole prairie was taken care of by, this is in Fontana, Wisconsin, was, was cared for and nurtured by community. And what happened then is they became, they had a higher level of ownership instead of hiring a company to go out and do all this. The Fontana has pride in their prairie. And I think they also have pride in its diversity. And I have to say, um, I think it's three, four years ago, Tom passed away with a heart attack. I didn't know he had a, a weak heart. He was only 66. And I miss him because I, I miss so much the conversations we used to have about, about plantings and native plants and all the possibilities that he could see that he still hadn't tried yet. And, uh, and there's probably 250 or 300 volunteers that he worked with in Barrington that miss him deeply too. So I, I really want you to, I'd like, that's why I just want to share this about Tom and, and everyone here that I'm talking about, the value of communication and talking and people that we can reach with one conversation that can make changes. We, are, we have the possibility to change and make changes by communicating. Um, when I move, I move on now to Cassie and Schmidt, and you can see who Cassian's with. You can see Pete Outoff's with Cassie in this picture, and that's like bang back to Pete, the connector. He always wants to take you somewhere where there's people that have he's worked with that have changed him and his ways, and introduce them to other people. So he took me to visit Cassie and Schmidt at Hermanshof, and when I got to Hermanshof. I, I hadn't talked to Cassie, and I saw all our native plants everywhere in beautiful patterns, as you can see in this picture. I'm looking around, oh my God, this was stunning, beautiful. So then I got introduced to Cassie, we walked around, we looked at named plants, and there's some I never saw before in my life, like Menarda Bradburyana, this was in 2007 or, 20, 2007 or 2008. And I go, geez, Cassie, where'd you get this? He goes, Roy, he's like, he's discouraged with me. <laughs> it's your own native plant, it's from I got a seed from Missouri, and I wow, and I, again, I go back to what I don't know, I don't know. And he's, he's got more native plants in his German prairie than we have in some of our commercial prairies. But the magical moment came when he said, take a look at, and what do you see? What don't you see? And I looked around and everything was gravel. And all I could see was gravel. I go, how do you weed gravel? That's gotta be hard on your knuckles and what do you do when you disturb the soil? You got to put more gravel down. So he told me about his concept and this shocked me. I, I'd never even heard of this. He puts five inches of quartzite gravel over the earth. In this next picture you'll see it. So he changes habitat. So if you put five inches of quartzite gravel down, weed seeds can't get through it. And then he he went to Missouri and went with someone to collect seed from Missouri, brought those plants back, planted them and put them in four inch pots and planted four inch pots in the gravel. And then the plants root into the gravel below and once they're rooted in, 
you don't need to water anymore and you don't have weed pressure because the agricultural weeds can't push through the five inches of quartzite. Now that was another day of what? <laughs> what? How? I've, I've only planted in the earth. I've never, in bad earth, good earth, it's still earth. I've never even heard of anything so unique and thoughtful and way out there in a way, it's very creative. And then we went to an, his other, his nursery for Herman's off. Not only was he planting in the quartzite chips, he had an area he was trialing with nine different types of gravel. And I said, okay, what university in the United States anywhere is researching this type of process? I, nobody. I can't think of any university. You know, most horticultural programs are looking at how do you spray growth retardant on plants so you can get more plants on a cage to ship to Home Depot. It's not looking, how do we change habitat and cultural conditions to get plants to grow? And how do we outsmart weeds? And how do we reduce the costs of labor and turn labor into joyful gardening? Cassie and Schmidt was doing all this. He was totally involved in monitoring, man managing maintenance costs, timing for everything, timing relationships, putting plants in, an amazing process. And not only was he, he thoughtful about it, he was good at it and still is. His documentation is probably the best I've ever seen for stewardship costs and maintenance and care. And when I left there, he got me to thinking about our maintenance program. And he got me to thinking, why don't I present numbers like this to our clients and let them know that actually in time, they're spending less money with us because the plants are becoming more responsible for their own well-being. And after meeting Cassie, and that changed the way I presented uh, maintenance. I even, we don't even use the word maintenance anymore. We use the word stewardship. And when I changed it to stewardship, some of the people around the lake even said, how can I help you? Before, if I said maintenance, they run to their car. Okay, thanks Roy, see you later. We don't want to main, maintenance is work to most people. Stewardship was how can we contribute? How can we be part of something healthy and beautiful? So when I, when I visited with Cassian and have seen a number of his presentations, he's the person of possibilities. A person that will show you all the opportunities and possibilities to come to know how to evaluate and monitor the way to plant and the way to care for your plantings. Very thoughtful and very creative. And again, then you pick up your own way of doing it. That doesn't mean you become Cassie and Schmidt or Pete Outoff or Tom Vanderpool or Ray Schulenberg. You don't become these people. You come to know them and understand their motivation and what they love. And then you bring that into your own way of being. All of you out there, you bring all these moments of people that have made changes and bring that into who you are and how you practice. So this is the gravel garden I put in at uh, Old Brook Botanic Garden about nine years ago. And it's, it's beautiful. And Jeff Epping at Old Brook loved this process. Now he's taken it to another level here in the Midwest. Jeff Epping's put in probably 30, 40 gravel gardens and he's taken it to a higher level than I would ever know how to do it. By the plants he uses, the combinations he's created, Jeff Epping is one of the best Midwestern gravel garden people, installation and thoughtful caring that I know in the Midwest. And where did it start? It started with Cassian. And I'm sure if Cassian was sitting here, he would tell you how he found out about it from somebody that he worked with when he was a young person. And Pete Outoff would share his stories about who he met when he was a young person. And so would Ray Schulenberg. All of us had other people in our lives that contributed greatly to the, the direction we're going or, 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 or discovered for ourselves. So Cassian was a, just a, 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 a good moment. And, a, and again, he and his wife are, wonderful people to be with and to share with 
and to enjoy it a day or a week or uh, they're just wonderful people. So again, it was another f um, turning point. And my next next one is Gerald Wilhelm. I met Jerry in 1979 at the Wharton Arboretum, and I was at the Arboretum Library in '79 trying to find plant books on plant relationships, who grows with who. I could find books on plants A to Z, but I couldn't find anything that said, here's Rebecca Fulgida, and Rebecca Fulgida lives with this particular group of plants. <coughs> so this young guy walks in, and I was, he said, we just started talking, and he pulled a book off the shelf, was Plants of the Chicago Region. And it had 18, I think, counties, or 20, and it showed every plant that relates to every other plant within the Chicago region. <clears throat> so I got to know Jerry, again, not well initially. I would see him every now and then. We'd talk about plants, and he was a botanist that worked with Floyd Swink on that book, Plants Chicago Region. And every time I saw him, we talked about new plants we've discovered, and I was the grower and planter. Jerry was the botanist and the relationship understander of how plants lived together in native plant communities and what direction they were going, actually from healthy to less healthy to disappearing in the Chicago region. And he was part of the team that, let's save the remnants. And this team did a wonderful job of that in Chicago. And Jerry, you see pictures of Jerry's book, uh, the last edition of, let me get to it here, Flora of the Chicago Region came out about three or four years ago, and it's an update from the fourth edition, Plants of the Chicago Region, so it's Flora of the Chicago Region. And he updated the plant material because he's still a field botanist. He still goes out and takes walks to all these, all these places to see what's changed in 35 years and he makes notes of that. So it has every plant that lives in the Chicago region and the associate for every plant. And you can see that on this page, the next page, Rebecca speciosa. It lists all the plant associates. And Laura Riker, who worked with Jerry on this last edition, she's listed all the insects she knows of that relate to every plant within every plant relationship. It's a stunning book. I brought some books in here to share with you. I, can't, I couldn't bring Jerry's book in. I couldn't carry it. It's 10 pounds. I just couldn't get it in the truck. But it's something, it's, it's so dynamic. And it starts with small reminders about who lives in association with who. And that gives you a direction to go when you put your plant patterns together. Um, and Jerry and I are working now on uh, constructing some pollinator gardens at Yerkes Observatory. But the construction of the pollinator garden isn't about as much, it's about the plants, but it's about the plant choices we put in to establish, he calls it aboriginal soil. So we're gonna look at the soil conditions as they exist now through 100 years of disturbance. And he's going to guide me as to what plants to put in and I'm gonna look at when to put them in in relationship to competitive nature of plants. And our idea is to seed the soil, not seed from the flowers, but seed from the roots, living and dying of the root systems that created the right biology, soil moisture, and soil temperature to get as close to aboriginal soil as he thinks we can. So I'm curious of how to do this. And we're gonna be doing it again at Yerkes Observatory and we're gonna do workshops on this to share with people what plants we use, why we use certain plants, and what plants we take out to put new plants in. And that's called gardening. So it'll, it'll, I don't know how many years the process will go on, but it could go on for 50 years, just like you would at the garden in Chicago, or, or the High Line in Chicago. That can be gardened for 50 years, plants coming in, plants going out, and that's called gardening. But our goal here is to look at creating aboriginal soil, how close we can get. And by creating aboriginal soil, Jerry's belief is we can get some of the insect populations back that need the specific soil conditions to live in with the context and relationship to plants. So I th look forward to that because I sure am when we start that in a few, few weeks, the process of thinking. And I hope to share that with all of you. 
And one of the things Jerry got me to try, which was very cool, if you see that picture, you see the oak tree here. We put this, or his neighbor planted this oak tree. And Jerry's thought was to surround the drip line of the tree, as you can see in the picture, with every plant, initially sedges, and then put plants in that oak tree has lived with. So as the drip line gets bigger, more sedges, more may apples, more flocks to varicata, more jack in the pulpits go underneath the oak tree. So that oak tree will never know the re a relationship without the plants it evolved with. And the goal is that would continue to keep the oak tree healthy as it matures. And as the canopy gets bigger, the drip line gets bigger, you keep expanding the sedge and plant community layer within it. And you can see the other picture, you can see the flocks de Vericata, Dodecathian media, the shooting stars. The sedge is mostly Carex pensylvanica and the potophyllum, mayapple, it's a cool idea. So you don't surround a tree with wood mulch, you surround the tree with the native plants to, that the tree has lived with. And again, both systems will live healthy. And then you have, like Jerry's neighbor, you have a little burn. You have a little woodland burn. You just burn around the base of the tree. And then you, ha you have that story to share with neighbors and let them understand what the possibilities would be for them to create something healthy and also work with young people. You know, thanks. You guys have listened to me for too long. I, I sometimes get carried away, but I, I, I really, enjoyed the time I had to share this with you and thank you for letting me present these folks to you who in the last well since 1978 since I started doing this have taken the time to care about me you know and the things that I was trying to learn and get involved with so I appreciate you all of you out there for sharing time with you and I hope this helps you and with remembering back and all the people that said hey let me show you something and the fact that we even paid attention was is good. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, I'll see you later. <laughs>